Uh, so for formality sake, again, my name is Tajuddin and I'm welcoming everybody to OLS9. I have Yo, who is the executive director of OLS, and Malvika, who is also a director uh, at OLS, with me here. The What we would like to do today is welcome everybody, know you more, and then we are also going to start actually thinking of tooling for the project. So what are the tools that you might need and how you go about it? The sessions are usually recorded, especially the code calls. And the reason for the recording is that we realize people live in different parts of the world. This time it might not work for everybody. And also it might not be a convenient time, even if the time works because you're engaged with other activities. So the idea is to always make sure that the calls are recorded and they will later be posted on YouTube so that other people on the cohort call can go look at the videos at their convenience so that we all have a, a general um, understanding of what's happening. Also, the notes are there to keep everybody aware of what's happening. So if there are discussions that we are having in the cohort call, if we write them down, it will help others that were unable to attend to see what has happened in order to um, be... Um, up to date with what is happening. So we have a few people joining. We have Manifest and Monsurat. I just shared a link to the meeting notes. And if you scroll down to about line 50, you can add your name, organization, project name, social media handle, and all that. Okay. Uh, we are going to start with some housekeeping. Basically, uh, because we understand some people like to talk, some people are okay talking in such um, calls while others prefer to write. So we usually like uh, people to write that down against their name. So if you go to your name in the participant list and click on more, you can see that you can rename. And then what we'd like you to do is add an S if you would like to speak during the cohort call, particularly today. And if you prefer to write, um, you add a W so that we can know those that are um, happy to speak and those that prefer to write. Uh, also for the breakout rooms, we are going to use that um, R, um, that is the spe speaking and writing in order to make sure that we assign you to the right uh, breakout rooms. Um, if you're having any challenge doing that, Kindly let me know so that we can, I can help you with that. So if you just go to the, your name in the participants, click on more, you can see rename and then you can add a W or an S. Maybe a hyphen, then I'll like, I, I will add S. Um, yes, so Alfreda has changed to W. Uh... Sorry, Tash, I would like to speak. Okay. Oh, thank you. That would be great. Um. So, yeah, I think we have Nihad and Faisal also joining us. So I'm going to share a link to the meeting notes again. Uh... Nihad and Faisal, if you scroll down to about line uh, 50, 54, you can sign in your name there, your organization. Um, if, if you're having challenge with, with changing or adding that R, um, S or W to your name, kindly let me know so that we can assist you to get there. I've seen Alfredo has has changed. Um, yes, please, Malvika. Yes, people can also use chat to say I want to use S. I want to use W. We have access to change your name. Um, so if you are struggling to find where the three dots are, don't worry. Just use the chat. Let us know what you um prefer today. This is only for today. Next call, you can decide to do something else. That's completely fine.
Thank you, Manifest. Now having to use my self-control and not to arbitrarily take control of Malvika's name and change it to something weird. <laughs> So you could either do that or let us know in the chat and we can help you do that if you're struggling with that. Okay, so while we're doing that, just to be conscious of the timing, uh, I think it's important to talk about the code of conduct. Uh, so at OLS, we have a code of conduct and it's applicable to all the calls that we host, including this one. We have the, if you scroll up to line 27, we have the code of conduct written there, a link to the code of conduct. Uh, I'm going to read some of it, but then um, you can also go back and look at, at the code of conduct. I'm going to share a link to the code of conduct in the chat directly, if you would like to also review it. But the most important thing, um, just to highlight some of it, is that as part of the Open Life Science Com Committee, is committed to providing the open life science community is committed to providing welcoming, friendly, harassment-free environment for everyone to learn and grow by contributing. As a result, we require you to participate, um, to follow our code of conduct. That is be friendly, be welcoming, be considerate, be respectful, be careful in the words that we choose, try to understand why we disagree. You can go to the um, link that I just shared to learn more about the code of conduct. So if you experience any act that contradicts what we have in the code of conduct, kindly send an email to Tim's, if, um, um, if you scroll down to line 91, you'll see that if you um, experience or witness unacceptable behaviors or any other concerns, Please report, and you can do that by sending an email to teams at openlife, um, we are OLS org, which I'm going to share the link. Or if you want to re uh, report an unacceptable behavior about um, some of the organizers, you can do that by sending directly to the email of one of the um, organizers. And you can see the emails on line 92, 93. Um, we have people joining, Alfredo, Fatima, thank you all for joining. I'm going to share a link to the note again so that you can add in your name. And if you have done that already, that's wonderful. Okay, so I've, I've said enough. I think um, it's important that we do a round of introduction. So I would start by myself and then pass it to the person on my right on the screen based on what I can see on the screen so that we can know about each other. If you have written that you prefer to write, you can kindly do that by writing uh, something about yourself in the chat or in the document. Yes, so my name is Tajuddin Gwadabi. I'm currently based in Nigeria and I am the project manager for the Catalyst project. And part of the Catalyst project, we are offering this um, open science mentoring training to the communities that are in the Catalyst project. Um, so I'm welcoming you um, to this um, training program. Yes. Uh, if you want to write, you can do that by adding your name, location, project name, and most recent hobby. So um, the next person on, 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 I'm going to start by the person on my, the first person on the screen I can see, which is you. Oh, yes, you is writing, not speaking. So, um, and she has written that in the, in the chat. So next up is Shion. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Shion, Shion Femi. Um, I am currently based in Nigeria. I work with the OLS as a residential fellow. 
and on this project, I am uh, I'm actually with um the bioinformatics <clears throat> outreach Nigeria. I'm co-leading bioinformatics outreach Nigeria, so to speak, rather. And um, we are actually building um the community of bioinformaticians, which actually use um open science principles to promote what they do. So my recent hobby, I, I can't even say, I don't think I have a hobby for now. So um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Shaun. So Rebecca is next, um, and Rebecca, Maria are in the writing group. So if kindly, um, yes, I'm going to read Rebecca. Rebecca, currently in San Jose, Costa Rica, I'm from Cabana Net Project. My hobby is puzzle. Uh, Maria, if you kindly write in the chat and I carried it out. Uh, next is Alfredo uh, speaking. Okay, so uh, I will introduce myself. Uh, good afternoon or evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Alfredo, Alfredo Quevedo. I am currently based in, Ar in Argentina in a central province uh, that is called Córdoba. Uh, I am applying to this cohort with my project that is named Tidy Screen that has to do with the with the search of new drugs for the to treat neglected diseases. And my current or uh, newest hobby is programming. This may seem like a little bit weird because I'm not a programmer. I'm a pharmacist, so. I am very interested and, and attracted by computational sciences and programming, so I am very happy to participate in, in this cohort. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alfredo. Uh, next I have is Bravin. Uh, hi, my name is Bravin. Uh, I'm a student from Kenyatta University doing my master's. So I joined this program to get some skills in bioinformatics. Uh, during my research work, uh, I, I, I found a challenge in my lab work and uh, I wanted to know more about uh, bioinformatics. So I saw this program, I applied for it and I hope uh, I'll learn a lot from this program. Uh, I'm currently, at, uh, I'm currently uh, participating in, uh, uh, in deciphering uh, an enzyme uh, that uh, mostly uh, that's always expressed uh, on glioblastoma, multiforms. So I'm hoping through this program, I'm going to at least have a linkage between uh, bioinformatics and cancer research. So it's going to be a, a very good program for me to develop as a young scientist. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to read out a few that have written in the chat. We have Fadi Kibilkis, I am from Nigeria. My project is Mola Health and my hobby is football. I also have Fatma. I'm Fatma Umar, an MSc student in biotechnology under the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya Initiative in Kenya, sharing a project with Alof on creating a database for coconut yellowing diseases. I enjoy reading and talking about science. Um, I have another one written. Um, hi, I'm Nihad from Sudan, currently based in, uh, at UAE. I am in the reading quiet phase these days as hobby plus singing, um, of course, to myself. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, next, I have Malvika, who is also in the writing, so I would skip to Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um... I'm Suzanne from Kenya. I am currently in Israel, uh, but I am a member of the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya. And I, we are working on a project, as Brevin said, we are um, co-project people. And we have other two people known as George Lugonzo, Lugonzo from Kenya and um, Ahmed, a PhD from Somalia. So we are together, the four of us, working on um, deciphering the role of PEMS, an enzyme on globulastoma multiform. And our mentor, a uh, very uh, great man known as Dr. Caleb Kibet. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here and uh, thank you. My hobby, my hobby, current hobby is um, 
okay, current, past, tomorrow will be, is <laughs> talking about science, cooking, and being out with friends. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I have two more in the written. So Malvika, namaste. I'm Malvika based in the UK. Um, open seats, hobby, maybe cooking spicy food at the moment. And then Maria Fernandez, university. I'm I'm sorry it's in Spanish, but I, I think it means the Federal University of um uh, Rio de Janeiro. And I'm from Cabana Net. My hobby is um dance. If if I'm wrong, kindly correct me. Portuguese. Okay. Um I have another um one written, um manifest, um Kelvin Chakalov, the lead software engineer at Mola Health. I am from Nigeria and also based in Nigeria. Hobby is coding. Um next in the speaking, I have Andres Oliveira. I hope I pronounced yeah. that correctly. Yes, yes, it's, it's perfect. Thank you. And nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Andres Oliveira. I'm also known as Oliver in my community. I'm the manager of Latin America by a machine, that it's a network uh, that aims to address the needs in terms of training and opening access to research infrastructure in bioimaging in Latin America. So our main focus is bringing together research infrastructure providers with biomedical researchers to drive science forward. So that is our main goal. And we are joining the Catalyst projects to provide this virtual hub for our community. And in terms of hobbies, I also play football as someone else put there and being with, with my family the rest of the time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I have Ruke. I'm not sure if it's her going to be uh, the person who wants to... Okay, yes. Um, Ruke? So I'll go to Adolf. I think Adolf is ready. Yeah. Um yeah. hi, hi everyone. Um Adolf or is Jamkama and um I'm a bioinformatician, still under training. Um I'm currently working at uh Camry Welcome Trust for my master's project and um from Pani University, that's the institution where I'm currently being uh, trained, hosted. Um for this for this uh uh, OLS program. I'll I'll be working with uh, Fatma on enhancing the openness in prediction of bacterial pathogens in yellowing disease of coastal Kenya coconuts through machine learning. And um, we've already met our meta, and I'm very uh, happy to to really delve in and and get to learn more. Uh, maybe uh, my hobbies. Um, I think I just love. Anything to do with computers, coding, and all that. Yeah, but I also love to go out and be in nature. Um, thank you. Um, uh, so Ruke is in the writing, so I'll be expecting. Um, the right in the chat. Next, I have Ahmed. So, Ahmed, are you able to speak or you prefer to write? I I, I prefer to write. I'm, I'm okay. submitting. Sorry. Okay, sure. Uh, so, if, if you prefer to write kindly, um, and so let me, the, the next person I have is um, speaking Faisal. Hi everybody, my name is Faisal Farlal Mula. I'm from Sudan, but now based in Addis Ababa, Soviet Union, the war in Sudan. I, I was the ex co IBI of FCC Riva in Sudan North. Currently, I'm co BI of Open Data Science Platform at the BSI Africa, representing Sudan. And our title of project. 
biomedical data in Papua Sudan. We want to look at the minute for biomedical data science. Uh, my hobby is reading. When I was young, I played football. Uh, I think about writing also about science, technology, and short story. Over. Um, thank you, Faisal. So I have um, Ruki from Mola Health. Um, so research and project oriented interest, hobbies, cooking, meeting new people, and traveling. Um, so I think Ahmed would write in the chat, and I hope I have not skipped anybody in the introduction. Yes, and I have that from Ahmed. So I'm Ahmed from Somalia, colleague with um, Suzanne, George, and Braven, background molecular biology and biotechnology, hobby, reading, and soccer. Yes, so really football seems to be a universal language. Okay, um, with that, I think we are going to have an introduction of the Open Seats program from you. I will hand over to you. Thank you um, so much, Tash. Oh, oh. One last thing, sorry. So um, I forgot to mention this. If you go to the bottom of the Zoom call, you might have that on the more where you can enable caption um, if you would require that. So it helps to um, kind of write what has been written, if that will be helpful to to you. Um, sorry, Yo, please take over. All righty then. I'm gonna do the screen share thing. Uh, I promise not to laugh if I have too many tabs open. Uh, okay. Am I sharing the one that I hope I'm sharing? Okay, I think that was a yes. <laughs> All yes. right, okay. Hey folks, so I'm really happy to be talking to you today. This is the ninth uh, cohort of training um, that we've run like this. Uh, we've been doing this since 2019. And I don't think anyone from the team would have guessed that we'd still be running this this many years later and in a ninth cohort. So thank you for being here. If your language isn't reflected in the hellos, let us know. Maybe we can add it in. <laughs> um, so anyway, why are you here? Or um, what are we going to be talking about while we've got you here? Um, and in OLS, we strongly believe that the reason we do science is because um, we want to actually advance human knowledge. And so in order to do that, we kind of need to share our work. Um, but it's not always straightforward or easy to do that. Uh, so um, there we go. I'm saying the slides before they even come. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's not always straightforward or easy necessarily to share work. Um, very often is the very common, oh, but like they'll spot something wrong or what if I've made mistakes? And, you know, it's perfectly normal and perfectly reasonable to be uncomfortable sharing things. Um, but we are lucky that we have learned and we are able to share as a team lots of ways different ways that you can share the work that you're you're um, working on in ways that maybe don't leave you feeling vulnerable um and ways that are more effective for sharing i'm just going to poke the chat make sure i'm not not saying anything i shouldn't say like the worst is when sometimes you know you're presenting and someone's like, yo, you're sharing the wrong screen, but you don't see that until after you've done presenting and you've just been talking to a blank screen for 20 minutes. <laughs> Would love to see Swahili in there, Susan. I have Swahili on my mug though. Um, Asante sana? But I know that's not hello. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, for the recording, if you're wondering, I was um, addressing the fact that Swahili uh, wasn't on the welcome screen. Um, Oh, and we've got Arabic as well. I'll, I'll, I'll give a go pronouncing that later if you want, but I, I can't read it. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll continue with the, pre the uh, presentation. Um, so if you're here, then generally the idea is um, probably that you're interested in open and you would like to learn how to do that with, with your work or maybe sharing it with people around you. Um, and that's what we're going to do for the next few weeks. Uh, 16 weeks to be precise. So um, we've got kind of a busy um, 
graph on the right, but it sort of shows the process that people go through or can go through when you're part of OLS, and it's uh, lightly color coded as well. Um, so as well as the one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring that you get, um, I think you've all been assigned mentors by now. Is that right, Tash? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you've already um, hopefully met with your mentors. You know who your mentors are. And then you get cohort-based training like this. And a lot of what uh, this training does is it gives you the chance to learn about different aspects of open science. It doesn't necessarily cover every single little thing um, because... We haven't got the years needed for that, <laughs> but it may hopefully make you think about things you haven't thought about before and know how to investigate them a bit further in the future. Um, and the idea behind it being 16 weeks and the alternating format between one week having a cohort call and then uh, another week having mentoring is that it gives you a chance to reflect and apply what you're doing to your work. Uh, to give you hands-on practice. So that means that you might say, you know, in the cohort call they said this, but I'm not sure if it's going to work or I'm not sure how to apply it to my project. And you can talk over it with your mentor. Um, whereas if it was just like a two-day training, then you probably wouldn't necessarily get the same chance to apply it and reflect on the things that are going on. Um, we have had uh, more than 400 participants going through the training so far. Uh, from lots of different places in the world, the only continent we haven't had yet is Antarctica. If you've got friends in Antarctica, ping me. We'll sign them up for OLS 10. One day we will get it. I have faith. <laughs> um, this is the ninth cohort. It's super cool. Uh, but people often um, participate in multiple roles. Uh, sometimes people are a participant more than once. I see a few familiar faces right now. Um, people may be a participant in one cohort and then later move on to become an expert, um, which is someone who presents in the cohort calls. Or you may uh, say, you know what, I've, I've been mentored and I'd like to give it back and I'm actually going to do mentoring now in the future. So there's lots of different ways that you can share your knowledge with people, even after you've engaged in the first place. Um, and we also make sure that people are able to afford to spend time on this. So roles like mentoring and expert speakers actually get paid a small honorarium for their time as well. Um, and we come from the Mozilla movement. So you may have heard of Mozilla um, uh, because of the browser, Firefox or Thunderbird, the email client. Uh, but a few years ago, they were super active in training people in different ways to openly share their work with one another. And when they actually started to to wind up that program and stop working on it, they said, you know, folks, if anyone wants to continue this kind of work, please take our stuff, please go forwards, please use all of the frameworks that we've been using to teach people things. Um, and so we are the grandchildren of Mozilla, maybe. <laughs> um, but there's some super useful practices. And anyone who has, was actually involved in the Mozilla training may recognize some of the slides that we're using at the moment, because uh, they're really good at um, movement building. Um, and this statement, you'll see it woven in throughout a lot of the slides that we present as a way of understanding leadership as someone who cares about working openly with one another. Um, and so open leaders, they design, uh, they build and they empower their projects and communities. And there's three different aspects we look at. It's making sure that the people who are with you can be understood and that they understand you, that you can share your work and that when you do your work, it's participatory and it's inclusive. So people feel like they are welcome to join and belong within your community and even help co-design the work that you're working on. Uh, so over the next roughly four months, we will be exploring different practices in open science. And I'll put a little star beside open science and also say um, open scholarship, open research, any of those words, open education, all apply. Um, we don't mean the term open science to be exclusionary. Uh, instead, we, 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 we like to look at it as very open and to say it doesn't really matter what type of um, research you're doing, whether you're at a university, whether you're at an independent research institute, or whether you research on your own. Um, and But we'll try and apply those um, the learnings that we're getting together um, to our work one step at a time. Um, and I'm guessing that this is really almost impossible to see on your screen, and it's very small and kind of squeezy, but it's also on the main uh, OLS website as well. Um, so we cover things in the cohort calls, which are the green ones along the top, 
like um, introducing, working openly, meeting each other, licensing your work so people can reuse it, codes of conduct to help try and maintain a safe space, um, a lot of different aspects of open science. So those are the open science garden course. And we talk about ways to engage people, the pathways and personas that you might be working with. Um, and uh, when we wrap up at the end, we also have a graduation. Uh, so that's where we ask people for five minutes to share their work. And um, we actually live stream that onto YouTube and people sort of say, here's what I thought I was going to do when I started. Here's what I've learned. Here's how we changed our plans. And here's where we're going in the future. And it tends to be really, really exciting. The graduations make me very happy and wriggly every single time. I don't think I've made it through a graduation without crying yet because yeah <laughs> anyway there's a few other calls um the ones over at the bottom that are in a kind of pinky color that cover some other things like github um which by the end you'll be able to make a website um open leadership and careers talks we talk about open source software and we've actually lost a word on that particular box that's all right um and also the fact that when you're working in big open projects like this very often it, it's it's something extra that you're doing at the side and I don't know about you but sometimes I have too many side projects and I really need a nap and, and a big mug of soup and actually just a rest <laughs> so we talk about that too about taking care of yourself and helping other people around you take care of yourself and I've just noticed that one of my favorite calls was hiding down here uh, we also talk about equity diversity um, and how to care for people around you um, ally skills so recognizing uh, when something isn't going well, but if you are in a place where you can safely say, hey, that's not cool to step up for someone who maybe in, is marginalized or is being treated badly around you. Um, I'm going to move on. Oh, yeah. Who are we? I'm the person on the left. Um, <laughs> I'm Yo. Uh, with us, we also have Malvika. Berenice isn't here today um, and Patricia isn't as well. Uh, we're the leadership team, so we're 100 times less important than the staff. We have uh, a whole bunch of cool people. Um, Taj is actually running this call at the moment. Um, Irene, she does a similar coordination for Nebula, our NASA program. And we have uh, Debs, who's a web developer, Bethan, who manages finance, Shaun, who's on the call today. Uh, Roland is a resident fellow. Um, and then we have Camille and Jalaga as well. Um, and even then, more important than those many faces is even more all of these faces. So this program would not exist without every single person who's here now, everyone who's working as a mentor, everyone who comes to share their knowledge um, when they're speaking. Um, and I'm really excited because we can add your faces to this list as well. And next time it'll be a little bit bigger. Um, but actually we're standing on the shoulders of giants with very, very tiny portraits just so we can fit them in. Um, welcome. You're here with us. I think that's everything. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to the mentoring and training um, exercises over the next couple of months so that we can look at positive culture change uh, in your community and we want to hear from you. And this should be fun. I'll stop. Um, thank you very much, you. So we do have a few minutes if anybody has a comment or a question. I think we can. If you prefer to write with either in the notes or in the chat, or if you would like to speak, um, raise a hand, please. Checking the notes. Okay, I think I think no questions. So the the next activity we're going to do is put you in breakout rooms where you will discuss three questions. What was your path to this program? How did you get into working open? How was your working open affected your leadership? Um uh, the questions are re be written by you in the chat. And what will happen is that I'm going to create a breakout room 
where I put those that would want to speak in the same uh, breakout room for speaking and those that would write want to write in a breakout room for writing. Uh, if you have any question on the breakout room, kindly let me know. Tash, um, Movika had her hand up earlier. Um, yes, please. I was on the note. Please go ahead. Yeah, Taj, I just wanted to take a moment to explain what happens for the written uh, breakout, if that's okay. So yes, this is something that we have been trying, we've been doing in the last few cohorts. We know that some people join from rooms that are loud and they can't speak or they are working from a low internet area or they're just very tired, so they don't want to speak. So which is why we asked you to change your name the S and W in front of your name allows us to see it very easily. As you can see in the participant, it gets sorted. So now Taj will be creating breakout room. It makes it easy for him to create that. So of course, you might know what happens in a spoken breakout room. We can go and chat. But what happens in the written breakout room is that you can still chat. You can use Zoom chat to talk to each other and respond to some question. Um, you can also use the, the Frama pad, but maybe easiest is to use the Zoom chat. And nowadays in Zoom chat, you can see you has responded to a thread. You can actually use the thread to respond to each other. At the end of your conversation, we'll tell you that 60 seconds remaining, please come back to the room. We'll ask you to copy some of your notes and put it in the shared notes so we can see it. Um, if you have any problem, you can also ask us to help you. You can either leave your room or you can invite us in. Um, if you're very, feeling very, very confused and don't want to go to your room, you can remain in the main room and ask us for clarification. So today would be a bit more explanation for what we are doing, but you will become used to it because we're going to see you for 16 weeks. So bear with us. It's going to get easier. Um, so I will open the breakout rooms if... Everybody is comfortable. I have opened. Um, if you can join directly, yes, people are joining already. Um, yes. Um, welcome, one everyone. Um, so I I would give um anybody from the speaking room wants to share. What happened in their room? We have, I think, two speaking and one and three writing. So, anyone from the two speaking rooms want to share? Uh, hi. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, we just had a meeting with Faisal and Susan. We were talking about, uh, okay, he was just trying to at least introduce himself afresh give more insight about what she, he has done over the years. It was a very good discussion, actually. OK, we will talk about, uh, OK, we asked questions about bioinformatics, uh, clinical research, uh, metabolomics, all the omics that are then from bioinformatics. So it was a good session. Uh, we, we were surprised why we were locked out, the three of us. And, Actually, it came out to be one of the some of one of the best moments maybe I had today because uh, Faisal is quite is knowledgeable and I'm surprised. So I think through this session, well, this is going to be one of the best program for me as a student. I'm going to interact with you guys and uh, I'm going to learn a lot now that at least we have a team of experts. Uh, for Susan, I know her. Uh, through my through the project that we are sharing together, she's also made knowledgeable, and I'm hoping that uh, through this program we're going to at least know, get to know each other more and more. Thank you. At least I'm getting to see the positive side of this program. Thank you once again. Um. Thank you. Thank you. 
that's really great. Um, I'm not sure if you had the chance to talk about the questions, but I think the conversation you already had is um great. Um, so we don't have a lot of time left until the end of the call. So I would um for those in the retro room kindly add notes and also those in the speaker room if you can add a few things from what you've discussed in the meeting notes. If you scroll down to about line 164, 165, you can do that. Um, with, with the introduction to OLS, I think the next thing is we're going to look at the tooling and uh, Malvika will be the one presenting that. So I will hand over to Malvika. Thank you so much, Taj. Sharing my screen. Um, so for you all, just so you know, this is the Prama pad that we are using. And you can see that we have some notes already. If there were some notes from your room you want to add, please do. Uh, right now, we are in this space. So Taj has just handed over to me. And I'll tell you a bit about tooling, tooling for project design particularly. As you saw in the talk that you gave about introduction to open seats, and you will see this curriculum a lot more. So we'll tell you where you are at in your learning. So today we are in the week two. You all have already brought a project idea because that's what you applied with. Um, and we are gonna think about your project and tell you some of the tools that we have come across that helps you in designing your project for better adoption, better community engagement. Allows you to work openly, which is one of the purpose of this program. So the tooling help you in clarifying and communicating your project idea. We may have a lot of idea that we want to do, and we may think that we have a lot of things that we want to achieve. But when we are trying to build a community or work with a team, we need to be very clear in being sure what is our idea. Do they understand the purpose of what we are trying to achieve together? Do you do they feel inspired by what I have? set as goal for my project. So some of the tools that we will be discussing today will help you think about your project very carefully, especially thinking about how can you involve and engage your community. So the learning objective for this today's session, so we're literally starting the main, main, main part of our uh, cohort called particularly curriculum right now. It will be to identify some tools that you can use in designing your project, thinking about who can be involved and where the work is needed. Maybe your work has been done in the prior years, but in the next four months, you're gonna think about what can we do next. You will also learn about Open Canvas, which I will introduce to you right after this. And at the end of this call, you will introduce you to the roadmap for your project with milestones, different tasks, different people that you wanna involve, and uh, documentation. The two talks, Open Canvas, Project Road Mapping, each of these talks will come with assignments. These assignments are for you to think about your own project. You will find previous co cohort calls, talks in our video library. You have access to the slide deck. You have access to all the things that we're going to talk about throughout the program. So if there is something that is not accessible, you can let Taj and I know. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move very quickly to Open Canvas. Open Canvas for project strategy. If you heard about project strategy before, if you've not heard about project strategy, it's more than planning. It's thinking about what we want to achieve, not just planning what we want to do next step. So as Yo said, we will be showing you this a lot. So we highlight design, building, empowerment. You are open leaders, and we will be helping you think about these three aspects in your project and for your community. So you can build whatever you're building so your community can understand what it is. They can share it with each other, and they can participate and feel included. Open Canvas actually come from something called Lean Canvas. It's used in companies a lot. These Lean Canvas is one page overview of the project. It is a way for clarifying your ideas, encouraging yourself and your team to think strategically about your goals and plans and what resources are needed. You also need to think about specifically, how can you make your project community oriented? How can you involve people's contribution 
is one of the key principles of working openly. So this is a very quick overview of what Open Canvas is. It's a you know, one single A4 sheet where you have different ideas that you will be exploring. So I'll walk you through one by one. So you would start often from the left side, um, problem to solution to key metrics, metrics for like, how do you know we're progressing? Think about what resources needed, who is required to do this work? Those who are required, how do they look like? Who would, they, who would be using the work that I'm using, building? You will also think about how would they engage with each other? So this is a very quick overview, which is why I'm going to take you slowly for the, each of these. You can divide your open canvas into two. Left side is about product. The product is a very vague word here, but product could be a documentation you're building, a software you're building, a project you're designing, an event you're designing. It could be anything that you're hoping to achieve. And on the right side, you think about community. Community as people who will contribute, who will use your work, who will participate in your work. Starting with the problem. Think about one to three problem you want to solve with your project. Then think about what are the solution for each of these problems. And we're specifically asking you to not think about more than one to three problems. The smaller the problem is, the better it is for you to design it. For each of the problem, you think about possible solution. You can always change the solution when you build your project and you realize the solution isn't true. But before you start, you actually do think about some solution. Then you think about how would you measure the success? How would you know you're progressing? How would you know there are some problems? In order to achieve the solution, what resources are required? Do you need people? Do you need money? Do you need hardware? What do you need? It could be anything. Then you go to thinking about contributors profile. You're not gonna do it alone, right? So we're going to community who is needed, who wants to be involved who is in my team already, who does not know how to contribute. So this is required very core to the project execution. You do need the resource and you do need the people to do the work that you want. Then you think about who will be using my product, who will be participating in the work. They may not be the same people who are developing it, but they may be people who are outside the scope. But eventually you would like for these users to become part of your contributors group. In order to engage your contributors, you will have a channel. Do you engage with them in a meeting? Do you engage with them on a Slack, on WhatsApp, in person, online, whatever that is. You want to talk to them, work with them, and you want to think about what that platform is. Same, you would think about users. Where, where are they finding out about your project? Where are they asking for help? Where are they asking for support? This one is where the community engagement happens. This is where your support for the community can be designed. And finally, unique value proposition. Thing that you're trying to build, does it already exist? If it exists, do you really need to create it from scratch or can you actually reuse it? If it has to be created, what is the unique solution that you're building that it should be there? So that's where we want to say you are your unique value. You are here, you have particular problem, you represent particular community, you have, you are bringing this unique value into the, into, into the project. So even if you adopt an existing project, the solution that you're creating would be unique. So with that, you can also look at some of the example. This example is about a contributorship. So let's say someone has contributed to a particular project and we want to give them a badge. So you can think about, you know, the problem is that people don't feel recognized when they contribute. Um, the solution could be that we actually give them a batch. The key metric would be the number of people who are getting badges. The resource required would be, how do we give them? Do we build a software? Do we send them a written certificate? So you can think about resource from that perspective. Contributors would be people who actually want to support their community in getting this recognition. User would be actually community who's getting the recognition. And you can think about how are you gonna engage your contributor in building this badge and how would you engage your user in receiving this badge? And the unique value proposition is, you know, that people actually get credit for the work that they do. So it's very simplif 
simplified version of what's written in here, you can come back and look at more example. We in fact have a, have a lot of open Canvas shared in our previous cohorts, which we can share with you. Yeah, and then finishing with minimal viable product, you can always continue to build your project, but you need to stop somewhere. You need to test, test your minimal project that you think would be important to build upon. So think about what is the minimum thing that you need? What concept comes from start? This concept comes from startup world because people want to show someone that their idea is actually valid so they can invest more time on. So what if you say my project does not fit, fit into this open canvas model? Um, it could be possible. Maybe you're trying to do too much. Maybe you haven't really found your scope. In that case, talk to your mentor, talk to your team members and figure out what, what can we do to find a narrower scope that we can actually achieve. Now, the next step would be that you would try to fill this open canvas for your own project. We will be sharing a template at the end of the shared document. Um, and we will also send that on Slack and email. So with that, I'm gonna stop here and ask you what questions do you have? Yeah, I, I think the table you refer to rather than community, if you give a number for each part, it will be better to follow up. Yeah, that's that's true. We can actually put that in our template. So our template has arrow. So we show people where which direction to go. But I have to say from my experience, you don't really fill your canvas in that arrow. Uh, you can always fill from here and there. It's just a logical direction that we provide you. So uh, we can definitely make sure that the template that we have can also include one slide which has arrow in it. Uh, not arrow, sorry, number in it. Okay, you. I just encourage everyone to fight with us. <laughs> we're not always right. And we're very, very happy to be told that doesn't make any sense. I mean, say it nicely, of course, but say like, I don't get it. Why, like, I don't see how I could apply this. And, you know, we love that kind of conversation. We don't want this to be a series of lectures. We want it to be conversation, learning, learning through doing, learning through thinking, if that helps. I think what would also help is that a lot of time things that we introduce may not sit directly but once you start spending time on it once you go back and think about your own project you would actually as you you said you may come across some gaps but open canvas has been one of the favorite tools in the open seats community people often come and think about their project in a way that they didn't think about before because they thought about one aspect but not the other they thought about resource, but not the people. They thought about people, but, but they forgot that people require support. So this is, this is a very good way to assess that. And of course, this is a very one single page. This will just nudge you to think about what else is needed. So don't take it as like, you know, this is gonna solve all my problem about project design. It will help you to get started somewhere, which is why it's, it's called Lean Canvas, because it's a small canvas where you can look at everything in one place. Okay, Taj, over to you. Thank you all. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so we're supposed to have another breakout, but I would suggest we have the road mapping and then if we do have time, we can have kind of a breakout that thinks about what has happened in, in both presentations. So with that, I will hand over to you for the project road mapping. Thank you so much, Taj. Folks, I'm really sorry that we're talking to you a lot of talks in a row. These calls often run long when we have lots of introductions and stuff. Um, but anyway, let's talk about project road mapping and share. Okay, dokie, you're seeing what I hope you're seeing? Yeah, I see some nods. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, you've seen that screen, so I won't worry about it too much. Anyway, why road map? So um, basically the idea is if you're working openly with other people, uh, they may or may not want to get involved, they might want to use your project, things like that. 
Um, and so one reason is that if someone doesn't have any idea what your project's going to be doing, they're less likely to want to get involved. Where if you, whereas if you say, this is where we're going to be going in the future, this is, you know, what's happening in three months, and this is what's happening in a year, and this is maybe where we think we'll be in three years, then people are more likely to say, yeah, that's a good vision, uh, and get involved, or say, oh my god, that's a terrible vision. And if you're wrong on the internet, they're going to correct you. So <laughs> you've still got a contributor. Um But also it's helpful for planning, um, you know, like, you know, that's a useless comment, apologies. It's, it's helpful to plan that you're actually saying, well, I know what I'm doing next week. I know the urgent emails in my inbox, but what am I doing next month? And what am I going to be doing if this all goes well in a year's time? Um, so the reason that we recommend creating roadmaps and thinking through this kind of thing um, is what I've just explained, um, but it can be really simple. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Jot down, get, get an A4 page um, and say, what is your project vision? Where do you imagine going? Where do you, what, what is, why does this exist? Um, but then start adding a timeline. Um, so you can say, okay, this is what we've done now. Um, you get some idea of where you're going to be going in the shorter term, and it tends to be very detailed when it comes to something close. So the thing that I'm doing in three weeks' time or three months' time will be very specific, and I'm going to say, I would like to do this in three years, but obviously there's so much that could change on the way that three years is not going to be nearly as detailed as the three months would be. And it will probably be a wasted effort if it was, because the chances of that still being correct in three years' time is uh, often pretty low, because we, we don't know what we don't know yet. Um, and so it can give you the chance to schedule work, to split it up with others, um, and also to track goals. One of my favourite things is coming back a year later or three years later and oh this is about five right now if I go and I look at what we were planning five years ago I, I mean I think I already mentioned in the opening of the call I'm not sure I would have believed if I said that we were not volunteers but we were a grant funded organization collaborating with people all around the world um, so if we're nothing else than that I recommend making sure you have some notes of your plans just so that you can step back and look at how awesome you are later um, so what goes in your roadmap? First of all, maybe some sort of welcome, uh, project summary, why this thing exists. Um, and this is for people who may have been sent directly to the roadmap. If this is the first thing they see from your project, if you're sharing it with the community, make sure that they know like how to position themselves. What is your project and why are they here? Um, and it helps give you a focus for the rest of the roadmap as well. So um, one thing that the governance team, I have, an, I have a governance team meeting with Olas in the morning. They're always like, yo, you're doing too many things. Tell me how this aligns to the OLS priorities. So it's nice to keep them up close and easy and understandable so that um, you, you don't forget them or stray off and do the fun, exciting thing or the urgent thing instead of the thing that's actually what you want to do. Um, tell people how to get involved. So um, they say the roadmap, they say, hey, that's cool. I like your vision. Can I can I come with you? Tell them where they need to go. Do they email someone? Do they join a Slack team? Do they join a Zoom call? Um, maybe there's something else instead. Um, but make it easy. Um, and I actually saw Debs, um, our web developer. She's not here today. I saw her give a talk where she had a really nice set of um, like calls to action. She said, if you have two minutes, here's, here's something you can do. And if you have two hours, here's something you can do. And if you have you know two weeks, here's something you can do. And that way, there was like a size that fit for everyone, um, which I think is a really nice way of sort of um, telling people, here's how to get involved. Uh, but make sure there's documentation. So if you have stuff that's written, Rather than you having to copy and paste it and say, go read that all the time, make sure it's easy for people to find. Um, and the timeline. So the roadmap is not just about the what and the how, but also when. Um, and like I mentioned, that probably is going to be um, more detailed when we're looking at things that are closer. So you might say, in June we'll do this, July we'll do that, um, August we'll do this. And then for 2027, it's getting vaguer. Um,
we like uh, one thing you can think of it is like steps in a ladder that you can see the steps on your ladder reasonably close um, and the ones that are near to you you have a bit more detail the ones that are far away slightly less um, but it gives people an idea of where things are going um, think about milestones so these are the really exciting things uh, so for example for OLS 9 for the cohort that you're part of a milestone might be the graduation um, but in your projects that's going to be something different is there something that you're going to be really proud hey it's release day or it's time for my paper or it's time for the event or the workshop that we're working on um, and think about multiple different time frames. So you want to think about the short term, but also medium and also long. Um, one to three milestones is a nice rule of thumb. Um, makes sense. Doesn't have to be hundreds. If you have hundreds, I hope you've got a lot of stuff. <laughs> but probably you won't. So one to three is a good number. Um, and for the closer ones, ones that are coming sooner, consider specific tasks, things that will break down into that roadmap. Uh, so, for example, um, OLS 9, some of those tasks that Taj might have written down when he was preparing would be things like invite expert speakers, pair people with mentors and mentees. Um, and that doesn't have to be on the front of the roadmap, but you probably want to write the basic list of tasks somewhere. It gives you a way to make sure that you're estimating the time correctly and that you're giving enough and that you're allocating enough staff and enough resources. Um, and then you say, OK, cool. So I've written all this down. What should I do with it? Um, so this really depends on how your project works. If you have a website, that probably needs to be a page on your website. Um, if you don't have a website, we can talk about that. We'll be talking, I think, are we talking about GitHub in this cohort still, Tash? Or is that? Yeah, we are. So we can teach you how to make your own website um, relatif relatively quickly. We'll also talk about using GitHub for collaboration. So you can put the files on GitHub rather than on the website if that's easier. Um, but think about what works for your audience. But the main thing is make it public because when it's public, people can use it. Um, and there's a couple of really nice examples here. So Laconga Physics uh, graduated from OLS. Oh. <laughs> okay, we need to check our links before we click on those. Um, I'm going to cross my fingers. I'm going to try clicking on this. All right here. Okay, don't look here. Look over there. Look at something else. Those used to be nice examples in the previous slide. Um, we will find some nice examples and post them in Slack instead. <laughs> um, okay, um, so we have sort of a summary here. Update it open. Make sure you have one to three milestones. Um, list tasks required to complete in those milestones and make sure you have a statement for why you're here and what you're doing. Um, and that's it. This is all over to you. You've got to take it away. Uh, Tash, you have the mic. Yes, um, thank you very much, you. So I will open the floor for questions. We have about nine minutes till the end of the session. I think uh, discussing here generally will be a better way to use the time than creating the breakout rooms. So if you would like to um comment on the presentation both the open canvas and the road mapping or you have a question um whether it's written or speak spoken kindly do that okay maybe i can start Tash. a very yes. very very brief question yes. is there any any recommended or or preferred tool to to manage tools, I, I mean, for the, to be used in the computer and any desktop application in order to 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 manage uh, projects and to and to perform the the roadmap and to keep the um, keep more or less updated uh, the the structure of the project uh, like Asana or those kind of tools. Because I I was uh, while while the professor was presented, I was more or less looking at the project canvas. A web page and that looks to be like a PDF file in which you should like write down the the project and and to sketch the ideas there. But is there any uh, computer application that more or less open source, obviously not paid, that may fit these needs for project management? Thank you. Um. 
Is that one for me or for Tatash? Do you want, you've got it? Nope, I think you should answer. Okay, deal. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So um, I think maybe when we cover this in GitHub, that GitHub it can be a nice way of doing that. It has um, project boards. Um, and actually one of the, the, the examples that didn't open, both were on GitHub and both would have been, it would have shown <laughs> the quite nice project management. Um, we also as a team in OLS use GitHub a lot. Um, but GitHub isn't for everyone. So, for example, someone might use Trello instead um, in a very similar way. Um, or I think you mentioned Asana. Um, I think it's less important what you use and more that it's accessible to people and that you actually keep it up to date. Okay, great. Thank you. you. Um, yes, I, I know some people use uh, Excel as well. The most important thing is keeping it up to date. Updating. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have one comment about same the product community table. Uh, the key metric is it possible to have standardization of key metric because maybe in future you can compare similar project. I'll take that one. Uh, Malvika got kicked out of the room that she was presenting in, <laughs> so she's had to drop off the call. Um, it's a hard one to do. So I guess, so let's say if I said the metric for OLS was number of people participating in a cohort, and I've just made that up, right? I, that's um, Then we have a couple of scenarios. One is that I might say that the higher that is, the better it is. Um, but then potentially we end up with the problem with quality. Um, but also that doesn't really compare to someone whose metric is release one paper and I'm not really sure how we could reasonably compare them. So I think the metrics are more for you to make sure that you're achieving your goals rather than comparing between projects, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you, you. I think we can take one more comment or question. Okay, so I would start the process of rounding up this um, meeting. The first thing is a general reminder. I have been sending emails on Mondays this week and last week, um, telling you what's happening on the cohort. If you have not been receiving that, kindly let me know, either here or through Slack. If you are not already on the Slack channel, also let me know where email or here so that I can make sure I send you an invite and you're added to the right channel. Um, so that's one. Secondly, the micro grant. So if your situation has changed and previously you have not requested a micro grant, but we'll need um, one now, um, kindly let me know and then I can send the link for you to apply for the micro grant. Um, so those are the two housekeeping. The other thing is the assignment. So we do have a couple of assignments for next week, not necessarily intended to be completed before your next meeting, but kind of start thinking of them. And these assignments, usually your responses change over time. And it's a good way also of understanding how much progress you have made. Uh, we have a, a few of them. Um, one is having um, creating a GitHub issue. The other one is if you have the time, reflection exercise, and then the project canvas, the open canvas, also the template is there where you can start thinking of it. And then if you do have the time, we have other right, um, article that you can read to help you. And then finally, if you do have any question, kindly um, write them here or leave, um, send them via Slack or email. And then also would like to get feedback for this call. 
So what worked for you? What did work? What would you have changed? What surprised you? And all that. We are using this question to help us improve the curriculum and also to make sure that we are tailoring the cohort calls to the need of the participants. Um, so any last question or comment before we end the call? Yes, please, you. Tash, I'm actually just going to suggest, since we've got two minutes before it wraps up, that we ask folks to leave feedback while they're here right now um, in the call, in that Etherpad. Yes, please. If you have any feedback, kindly, when you scroll to line 271, Uh, okay, um, Nihad, if you can, please give me your email address. I will send you a link. Uh, yes, please, email addresses will be helpful, and I will send you a link. The, 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 the emails, I hope everybody is receiving them. Okay. Shall we set them free, Tash? Yes, please. Thank you very much for joining. Um, this is the first cohort call. Next week, we have question answer session. So it's optional as well. And then the idea is to talk about some of the questions you have. And what we we'll do is not just for the open uh, the open seat program, but generally for the um, Catalyst project. So if you have any question for any part of the Catalyst project, do join us next week. And we are going to attend to most of the questions. Um, so thank you all, and I'm going to stop recording now.